Everybody should hear me now? Yes, perfect, perfect. Uh, let me just full screen this so we have a great presentation. Yes, perfect. Uh, yeah, hey, hello, hi. Uh, glad to see so much people here, especially since this, the whole block is pretty much talking about stuff that's not React. So it's great to see a lot of people here. And I have the honor of starting this block by talking about a little bit about the world of web components and the fact how we can start achieving more with less. So the mandatory who are my slides first. Uh, my name is Matthias. I go by the alias Matsu pretty much everywhere in the internet. So if you have some seen bad jokes by a Twitter user called Matsu, that's pretty surely me. Uh, I run a small software company here in Finland called Simpler. And on top of that, I do quite a lot of open source work in the web component space. Uh, here's my socials if anybody wants to follow me after the conference and a mandatory picture of my pet to win the audience over. So let's get started. So yeah, we've all been there. We want to set up a fresh new React project for our hobby project. And we go with the trusty Create React app, because why not? We wait for one exact eternity for it to start in finish installing. And when we are finally finished, we have the project on our computer. And we take a little bit of a look of the output of the install dialog. And we see that, yes, Create React App finally only ships only 39 packages in the starter nowadays. And then we are pretty much dropped back into the reality of the fact that there's over 1,500 1, packages being installed on our computer. Looking a little bit deeper into what we have installed there, we have six moderate vulnerabilities installed onto our computer from the get-go. That's a great start for our hobby project. And I'm sure that anybody who has maintained dependencies on a larger project knows there might be even more vulnerabilities lurking in the 1,500 packages we just installed. And if anybody had to work around the Node IPC debacle earlier this year, with the severity rating of 9.8 out of 10, well, you know that the vulnerabilities can be quite bad. Like, they can even allow malicious code access to your own machine and just wipe out your drives. So you might want to take a look at your dependencies before you install them. And coming back to the install dialog itself, we also see that there's a whopping a little under 200 packages which are looking for funding to keep alive. I actually looked at it yesterday. It was over 200 already, so it's growing rapidly. And as to past has shown, money and open source sometimes might lead into a little bit, bit of a sticky situation. For example, if we take a look at LeftPad, it's a great example where the developer of the package got into a heated argument with some business people and just took his packages off NPM and broke about to 20 million installs in one day. So yeah. And then there's cases like what happened to Faker.js. A couple of years ago, the developer was asking for some funding from bigger companies and maybe some companies to employ them. And since that went nowhere, they just wiped everything out of NPM and again broke pretty much millions of systems around the world. So the moral of the story here is that please take care of your packages, keep them up to date, and try not to include unnecessary dependencies. And hey, maybe even throw a euro or two towards the developers of those packages, because they are really doing a great work on the, on the scene. And there was this old saying that the, on old computers that when you, by the time you get home with your home computer, it's already outdated. And I think the same applies to your web application. So by the time you are ready to ship your application, your dependencies are most likely half outdated already at that point. But there is hope. For example, Vite has been putting out a better starter for us React developers, only packaging packages in the double digits. So that's a great, great transition from 1,500 packages. And if we look at Versal and Next.js, we, we see that it's gone even further with just 19 packages in the starter that the developers are installing. And of course, the functionality is a little bit different in these packages, so you cannot compare the, them straight up. But these are the starters that the developers around the world are using, so these are the greatest thing to compare here. But do we really have to haul around such a heavy set of packages? Uh, what if we could get some of the functionality of these front-end frameworks and libraries, which, 
some of the functionalities that these libraries provide, but without having to install a whole suite of dependencies onto our computer and shipping it to our customers. Well, inner web components. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of what web components are, a quick summary from the Mozilla web docs itself is that web components are a suite of different technologies following, allowing you to create reusable custom elements with their functionally encapsulated away from the rest of your code and utilize them in the web apps. And that's quite a mouthful. Everybody has to read that like five times to understand even the gist of what we are working with. So let's break it down a little bit. Uh, some of the key features of web components include being native to the browser and the possibility to use them in pretty much any project you are writing at the moment. And let's dig a little bit deeper into the list by looking at the listed features one by one. First off, web components are a set of web platform APIs. What this means is that they are they can be used anywhere on any modern browser without the need to install any external tools or libraries. Everything just works out of the box. So in this picture, we have a functioning setup in CodePen, which is a code editing tool on online. It doesn't have any extra setup, just JavaScript and HTML, because everything else that we need is shipped by the browsers itself. So everything is already built into our browsers. And Another great feature is that Web Components allows us to create uh, custom HTML tags. So with Web Components, we are able to embed functionality and styles straight into our custom HTML tags. And the cool thing about this is that we can fully encapsulate the functionality inside of these components itself, and it won't be leaking anywhere outside of our component itself. And pretty much this is like creating React components for our application but everything that we need to create these is already in there in the browser. No, no installs required. And how this encapsulation is achieved is with a technology called Shadow DOM. One of the higher level features of Shadow DOM is the fact that it allows us to create hidden DOM trees to be attached to custom elements. And what this means is that the element might consist of multiple elements under the surface, but the visible part is in the user DOM is only the component itself. If we take a look at the, some native HTML elements that are already utilizing this, under the surface, we can take a look at the input element we use on a daily basis when we are inputting forms or filling out forms online. The input element actually hides a lot of spans and divs inside of it for it to look like it looks like. But when we are using the component itself, we are just writing input type dates. So we are still getting a whole lot of more HTML under the surface in the user agent that the browser it renders. And the same kind of hiding of DOM trees can be done with web components. So, and it actually is rec recommended because there's so many upsides to using these. And what this means is, is that we can have developers just write out one HTML tag and be able to get a whole lot of functionality out of it. And continuing on why Shadow DOM is such a great feature and why web components want to utilize it is the fact that we can create truly encapsulated styles. So I'm sure everybody here has run into styling namespace problems when writing CSS globally. And when you are working with Shadow DOM, you can write CSS inside of your component without it affecting the application surrounding it. An example of this style like encapsulation we can see here. So we have written a CSS rule that targets H2 elements, turning them red. But as you can see, the H2 element on the regular DOM is colored black. So none of the styles we use there are leaking outside of the shadow DOM, and it also goes the other way around. So if we used global styles, they would not be penetrating the shadow DOM. So we are creating two style boundaries all natively. And then finally, there's slots. I mean slots. Uh, slots allow us to create placeholders inside our web components that the developer can fill with their own markup. This allows us to create separate DOM trees and present them together to the end user. For example, we have an input element web component here on the screen, which has two named slots. We have the prefix slot, we have the suffix slot. And the end user can then add their own custom markup to these, con to these slots to add content to these slotted areas. And in, in an application, you would do something like this. So the developer uses the web component, they can add their own custom HTML and assign it to the slot with the keyword slot. And the elements are then linked to the shadow DOM 
and they are showed alongside the contents that in, that's inside of our shadow DOM uh, DOM tree. And coming back to the main key features, there's also the fact that web components are based on web standards. And what this means is that all of the functionality to create these web components is built into a browser, like I have been saying, and it's usable without any external toolings and libraries. So that is something you cannot really understate, because if you are able to create experiences without having to import any libraries, having to bundle any dependencies, you are pretty much working with some superpowers over here. <laughs> And finally, web components are library and framework agnostic. So the greatest part here is that you can slap a web component on pretty much any framework you want, or even use them without a single framework going completely vanilla. So you can just develop web components and sprinkle them across all of your applications, no matter what framework you are using to build the application itself. Okay, so we went through quite a lot of features of the web components itself, so let's do a little bit of recapping here. You should give, be giving web components a try because they work on any modern framework. So if you are using React, Vue, Preact, SolidJS, you name it, they should be usable within those frameworks. Well, with React, the story is a little bit iffy, but in React 19, we will have the year of web components finally. Uh, they are also future-proof, so the web, web standards are more future-proof than pretty much any JavaScript framework, because frameworks might just come and go, but web standards are really less prone to change. Uh, they provide a true right once use whenever experience, due to not relying on a framework or a technology. And they provide full encapsulation of styles, so with Shadow DOM, so what this means is that we can freely style our component without having to stress about having a conflict with a design system that we are using or a application we are applying our components to. So we are pretty much shipping the same thing to the user as they see on our site without any hassle at all. When you are using these web components, the code is more consumable because it can be shared and maintained between teams more easily. You don't have to be updating three versions of your own design system at your company because one team is using Vue and one team is using React. You can just have one design system and then you can just use that between all of your uh, applications in your company. And when we are looking at the current web landscape, we can see that the adoption of web components is growing at a rapid rate because every one out of five page loads currently contains web components already. And I can pretty much promise that every one of you in this room have been using web components whether you knew it or not. As an example that will never let me down, we can take a look at YouTube. The YouTube web UI has been powered by web components for a long time now. On top of that, sites like GitHub are rolling out UI enhancements in the form of web components. This shows that you don't need to go all in on the technology to be able to benefit from it. You can just sprinkle some components to enhance your UI and be done with it. And then there's large companies like Adobe who are creating a lot of their web experiences using web components. But then you maybe start to ask like, can web components really be used to create complete complex applications? And the answer is absolutely yes. A grand example of this is the Photoshop client for the web that there was released about a year ago. And there was an article at that time on the Adobe's journey on bringing Photoshop to the web. And one key implementation detail in the process was, well, you guessed it, web components. You can also have a nice mini game counting the times I have to use the word web components on stage. So. I might have wanted to start that from the beginning, but if you start now, it's, only, it's gonna be in the triple digits already. <laughs> uh, asking a developer at Adobe, the application isn't just a, the Photoshop for web application isn't just a dash of web components, but starting with a Photoshop web dash app, and it's being all the same all the way down. So it's, it's completely built on components. The great thing about this technology is that you can dash a little bit of it into your application or you can just go all in on it. There's no limitation between them. And most of the UI elements they are utilizing at, in, at Adobe are of their own Spectrum Web Components library, which is a lightweight implementation of the Adobe design system. So this really comes up to the fact that web components really are everywhere from SpaceX spaceship UIs. So web components went to space already. 
uh, to global banking software. And the list of companies that are adopting this technology is incre increasing at a weekly basis. So we can see that a lot of fan companies are already using the, this technology, and there's a growing number of large companies also utilizing this web tech. And the adoption of web component libraries is on the rise too, because Lit HTML, one of the most popular templating systems for web components, is closing in on a million weekly NPM downloads. I mean, it's peanuts compared to something like React, but it's still a huge adoption pace for such a such a growing technology. So, okay, let's, that's a lot of talk on how great web components are, but how are they the right? Developer experience is really important after all. Like, if you are going to have a bad time writing web components, you're not going to be approaching them. But if you have ever written React class components in your life, you should be more than familiar with the approach of web component libraries like Lit, because as anybody who attended the workshop this week, they know that the similarities are really quite similar. And even if you're not using any libraries at all, the approach isn't all that much different. It's a bit, li little bit more of a setup to get everything working, but you can get there without using any helper libraries. And while you, also of course, could start building everything from scratch, we have customer demands to fulfill, we have projects to finish, and some things just might not be worth building yourself. This is where we might look into some extra help, something lightweight and prefer preferably something that doesn't package a lot of dependencies with it. And this is where we might look into something like Lit. Uh, Lit is a five kilobyte library designed to use, is the development of web components. It's developed by Google, so it's backed by a large company, take it as you may. It functions as a lightweight helper library to create, help you create complex web experiences just a little bit easier. And for five kilobytes, it's really packing a mean punch. And if, you even, if even five kilobytes is too much for you, Lit packages its rendering system, which really helps you create components in just like three kilobytes. So it's even light, more lightweight. And then if you are really liking how React is to write and you want something a bit more modern, so to say, uh, maybe something working with hooks. You could take a look at something like Haunted, which is a library implementing React's hooks API, utilizing Lit as its rendering system, so pretty much everything you write is the same as you would be writing React, but you, your JSX is just template literals with HTML tags. But as we are talking about reducing our dependency footprint, you might be keen on trying to write your own base classes to help you write web components faster. And that is, that is completely an option. You don't have to use the library at all. For example, companies like GitHub have actually done this with their Catalyst project. They are using their own base classes and their own libraries to implement their simple web components because they don't need a complicated rendering system or life cycle methods that Lit might provide them. But no matter the approach or library you will be picking to create web components, all of the promises we went through hold still. You will be able to create framework agnostic components which you can attach to any of your projects. So no matter if it's WordPress, React, Vue, SolidJS, just plain old HTML or even PHP. So let's summarize. Uh, being framework agnostic means that we can write our UI components once, and then use them anywhere, no matter the framework or library of our application. And as a Java developer, this really warms my heart that we can write once, run anywhere, because Java used to hold that crown, and now web components are pretty much trying to take it. And when you are able to use your UI components between your projects, it becomes more of a question of how much of that UI you need to rewrite in the feature instead of when do you need to rewrite the whole UI of your application. So the next time you are writing a React component for your application, sorry, you should consider if it could be written as a web component instead. So thank you, that was me.